Today we have the pleasure of talking with George Lovenstein, who is the Professor of Economics and Psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome George. Um, this week you're giving a PhD course in Behavioral Economics here at the Fair Center. Um, do you want to say something about, is there a specific principle or a perspective in this field that you think anyone should know about? Well, I would say that there is something um, in particular that I tried to emphasize in the class. Um, the class was all um, PhD students at different stages in their um, academic careers. And I find that uh, most PhD students are very smart. I find that one of the stumbling blocks for a lot of PhD students is coming up with new ideas. And so in my lectures, I tried to um, focus a lot on kind of where ideas come from and um, how to come up with interesting good ideas. And um, they, good ideas can come from things like novels or movies or from conversations that you have with people from personal experiences. And so um, something unusual that I did in, um, in the different sessions that we had was to talk a lot about the origin of each of the projects that I discussed. So then not just focusing on the technical side on how to test the ideas, That's but right. really taking it one step back and focusing on the ideas themselves and That's how right. to develop them. That's right. And I, I, I kind of had an overarching title for this session, which was a narrative introduction uh, um, to behavioral economics. And so, yeah, each of the projects was um, preceded by a short story. Uh, when looking back, uh, you helped found the very discipline of behavioral economics, um, including the part known as uh, choice architecture and nudging. Um, how well do you think the field is doing so far? Mm -hmm. um, I did, uh, so I spent, the class lasted for four days and I devoted one full day to talking about behavioral economics and public policy. And a lot of what I talked about was nudges, and I'm a great believer in the usefulness and effectiveness of nudges. But I did, um, especially at, um, in the introduction to the day, I devoted some time to talking about some misgivings I have, which is that um, nudges have become Sim, um, synonymous with behavioral economics and behavioral economics and public policy has become, become come to be thought of as nudges and I think that behavioral economics has a much much broader application to public policy than simply um, nudges. For example if you think about something like climate change and a classic nudge would be to show people their neighbors' energy use, which um, has been shown to reduce people's energy consumption by a small amount. But when it comes to climate change, it's um, anybody who knows anything about climate change knows that what we really need is a carbon tax. That's the only effective policy that's going to accomplish a whole lot of different goals um, simultaneously. And behavioral economics has a whole lot to offer when it comes to how a carbon tax should be implemented. For example, psychology, what, what's going to make a carbon tax palatable to people? Um, how should we return the revenue from the carbon tax? If the carbon tax is applied to the prices that people pay for different goods, should the carbon tax be integrated in the price that people pay, or should it be segregated? So there are a whole lot of different psychological and behavioral issues that are really essential when it comes to implementing a carbon tax. And that's just one of many, many examples of how behavioral economics can play a role um, in public policy that goes well beyond nudging. So the, so the main concern isn't that nudging seen in isolation can be effective. Mm -hmm. Your main concern is that we might end up overemphasizing nudging and instead of also studying how behavioral economics can inform policymakers, better regulations and so on. And your point is we need both. That's right, absolutely. Um, and a particular danger, and I presented some research documenting that this is indeed a danger, 
a particular danger is that in some cases people may um, view the nudge as a kind of a quick fix for a problem that the nudge doesn't really tackle. And to that degree, on, and only to that degree, um, nudges could be potentially harmful if they are viewed as substitutes for more substantive policies. And some recent research that I did with David Hagman and Emily Ho kind of substantiates that concern. It shows that when you um, present people with a nudge and with a more substantive policy like a carbon tax, just telling them about the nudge reduces support for the carbon tax. So this isn't just an, an assumption or a hunch you have, but it's actually something you have turned into a research question and something that you have gathered data on suggesting that this is actually the case, that that's this, right, that that's this right. might happen. That's right, and that's one of the projects that I presented to the students during these four days. Uh, can you also say something about the type of research that you find the most interesting right now? Like, is there any new ideas out there that can help us move forward and really learn something new? Well, um, today I um, talked um, quite a bit about um, research on privacy and the how the implications of behavioral economics for privacy. But in the course of studying privacy, I've become convinced that the desire to share information, like the feeling of be bursting with news or confessions, gossip, and so on, and even things as mundane as rating products, like getting on um, Amazon and like um, rating a product, like why do people do that? So in the course of studying privacy, I've become convinced that the motive to share information with other people is really a much more powerful motive than the privacy motive. And that's become a big interest of mine. I'm doing um, a bunch of research th with that, some of it with a graduate student named um, Aaron Carbone, um, but um, a, a diversity of projects on information sharing. Uh, and I guess this would be an example where traditional economics will struggle to provide a good explanation for why people would care sharing information in the first place in, in these cases. That's right. And so um, traditional economics, even psychology, there's not very much research in psychology about the desire to share information and virtually zero research in economics on the desire to share information, even though in the information age and the age of social networks, that plays such an important role in our day-to-day -day life. So then I want to turn to my final question, um, and that is about the interdisciplinary nature of behavioral economics. Um, my impression is that most economists and most psychologists tend to hang out with their own tribe kind of working with others from their own field and publishing only in their own journals. Uh, but you, on the other hand, you have constantly been combining and integrating the two. Um, and you have published research in the leading journals in economics, in psychology, and in the general sciences. So do you have any advice for young researchers that want to do something similar, that want to connect the two disciplines in a better way? Well, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in the benefits of specialization, not only in terms of um, disciplinary specialization, but also in terms of methodology. Like there's some people who are really good at theory, some people who are good at econometrics, some people who are good at experiments. And pe it is good for people to focus on the things that, they're, that they are best at. But there are also tremendous gains to trade. So I would suggest for anybody who's interested in doing interdisciplinary research or, multi or multi-method research, the best way to do it is to first specialize yourself and then and to work with people from the other discipline. And then really that's the way that, that that's how I've proceeded myself. Mm -hmm. And then in the process of working with people who have different skills than you have or who are in different disciplines, you are just going to naturally tend to assimilate their expertise. And after a while, it will become natural for you to start operating 
in their discipline or using their methods as well. So I guess my advice would be to um, specialize, but, uh, but then to try to work with people who have different perspectives and different skills from the skills that you, and the perspectives and skills that you have. So uh, making sure that you know your own specialty in such a way that you actually have something to contribute. Yeah, that's with, right, exactly. Uh, yeah. To people from mm -hmm. the other side of the fence right. that you can get you started. You don't want to begin so kind of well diversified that you kind of roll off the table. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, then I think we will end on that note. Um, I just want to thank you, George, for giving a terrific course in behavioral economics here at FAIR this week. And uh, thank you for sitting down with us for the, this chat. And I'd like to um, yeah, thank FAIR. It's been a, um, a, a terrific um, four days. The students have been fabulous and the colleagues have been fabulous. It's been a great experience. Thank you. Thank you.